Okay, the last uh, thing that, that we discussed in the previous class was um, an anionic covalent organic framework, which is based on macro cycles, which are interconnected by BO4 units. Um, and because uh, these uh, BO4 units have a bond which has is carrying a, a formal negative charge, there must be uh, metal plus cation inside of that of the pores of this green organic framework, which charge uh, compensates that um, negative charge. So tether coordinated bond is one possibility how you can create an anionic covalent organic framework. Another possibility is uh, hexa, hexa coordinate uh, silicon. So um, you see here uh, molecular anine in which uh, silicon is being bound to um, six uh, oxygen atoms and these six oxygen atoms are bound uh, to uh, uh, benzene rings so overall we have three catecholate ligands surrounding a silicon atom and the silicon atom formally carries a two minus charge and therefore we have an we have an anion. We can make um, this molecular anion in a pretty simple fashion using a silica precursor, for example, uh, tetramethoxysilane or also silicon dioxide um, in the presence of a base, for instance, um, um, as, um, sodium methoxide and um, a solvent like, like methanol. So we can extend this kind of chemistry again to make covalent organic frameworks. Um, so instead of a simple catecholate or catechol ligand, which is monotopic, we can use a ditopic linker. And then you're forming a two-dimensional covalent organic uh, framework of, 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 this, of this kind. Here under similar condition. So again, you can start out with tetramethoxycyne or silicon dioxide, and you react uh, these silica precursors with a ligand in methanol in the presence of a base, which again can be lithium, sodium, or potassium methoxide. In order to crystallize this framework, you need pretty harsh temperature conditions. So, though, so in order to make the molecular anion, 60 degrees are enough. In order to really crystallize such a framework materials, you need 180 degrees Celsius for four days. So this reaction here proceeds all in one hour, as, as you can see. For this reaction here, you need four days. And that's because you, we constantly have to make our framework self-repair so that it can actually crystallize. So um, what you should keep in mind here is that this is a two-dimensional um, framework material, but um, it's actually not a completely planar material. So that is because the silicon is actually octahedrally coordinated, okay? So that means these building units are actually not, these organic building units are actually not lying uh, planar as it is shown here, but they are actually twisted out of the plane. Okay, and they're twisted out of the plane by, uh, by 60 degrees, okay? And then just by twisting these um, organic units six times gives overall uh, 360 degrees or uh, 360 de degree um, um, rotation, okay? So actually have the silicon here surrounded by these ligands in a, in a propeller-like in a propeller-like fashion. Okay, um, so here is a related material. Um, so in this case, we are replacing the, uh, the ditopic, uh, a ditopic ligand with two um, um, also um, alcohol units by a tritopic ligand ligand, which has actually three uh, <clears throat> also alcoholate um, 
units that can again bind to silicon. And then again, the silicon is octahedrally coordinated. Okay, and you see here how three um, tritopic ligands actually surround a, a single silicon here in the center of the um, octahedron. Now you connect uh, three tritopic ligands together. Okay, so the silicon itself is, is tritopic, but the ligand itself is also tritopic. So you're actually forming a three, three um, interconnected framework. So you have, have actually here a higher degree of framework connect, uh, connectivity. And that uh, leads to additional difficulties to crystallize the um, um, material. So um, if you try to synthesize it uh, like um, the material that we just discussed before, you will find that it does not crystallize, even though the chemistry is very similar. Rather than that, you need a special uh, precursor and make the crystallization succeed. And this is this methyl sil trimethoxysilate. And the key here is that this methyl group prevents actually that the condensation of the framework occurs too fast. It actually slows it, slows it down um, because this methyl group is being terminal. And the um, uh, silicon carbon bond here is pretty strong and only over well, a larger, a larger time frame, this silicon carbon bond here eventually uh, cleaves under the reaction conditions of 180 degrees uh, for four days in the presence of sodium methoxide. Okay, so eventually we will replace here these silicon carbon groups in the SIME unit by silicon oxygen bonds. Um, forming, well, methoxide units, and then these methoxide units are getting replaced by uh, the, the uh, uh, catechol units here. So um, you see again here that in order to crystallize the covalent organic framework, you really have to fine tune the reaction conditions in order to make the framework um, crystallize. So in this case, a special precursor is needed in order to uh, slow down the framework uh, condensation to an extent so that the crystalline structure is being formed, okay? So in this case, as you can see here, you're forming a, again, an interpenetrated structure. So we have actually three, uh, two three-dimensional frameworks with the three, three connectivity that are interpenetrating each other. The driving for, for this is again, that nature actually hates uh, space, so it, uh, empty space. So it tries to fill empty space, space as, as good as possible. And that can be uh, realized by making two identical structures actually interpenetrate. And this gives the overall uh, covalent organic framework material here. So again, this framework material is anionic. So you have to imagine that you will have um, additional extra framework alkali cations. So either lithium plus sodium plus or potassium plus depending on well which methoxide you are using, whether you use sodium methoxide as a base, uh, lithium methoxide or potassium methoxide. All right, um, so you cannot only make anionic covalent organic frameworks, you can also make um, cationic ones, and that's actually a significant uh, uh, difference to um, silicate uh, in zeolite materials, which are always anionic, um, covalent organic frameworks can be either anionic or they can be cationic. Um, so all you need to do is actually to start out with 
uh, a cationic building unit, for instance, this one here. So here again in this reaction, you have a so-called shift base reaction. You have here these am am amino groups as reactive groups, but you have also this quartony nitrogen here, uh, which uh, is charge compensated by this bromide here. But despite the charge, the polycondensation reaction still works. So you can uh, react this cation with this trialdehyde in, in order to make a three, two interconnected interconnected framework, which is then cation. Okay. You can actually also exchange then the bromide ions by other anions. And that can be done even with very large uh, anions, like for instance, polyoxymetallate uh, anions. And these anions are actually acidic. Um, and this way you can, for instance, turn such a cationic covalent organic framework into a proton proton conductor. So the polar oxymetallate units uh, uh, still carry acidic uh, um, um, protons around, which are then also inside of the channels and the overall framework then becomes <coughs> proton conductive. And those covalent organic frameworks have been investigated uh, already also as uh, membranes and fuel cells. Okay, um, so now this is what I wanted to tell you about uh, covalent organic frameworks. And uh, this content will still be part of the exam. Um, what follows now will not be part of the exam anymore. And the next chapter, which, will, which we will be discussed now, will be on a few non-crystalline porous materials, okay? So all crystalline, all porous materials which we have discussed thus far are um, uh, crystalline materials. At least these materials had uh, crystalline pores, okay? Um, but not necessarily um, porous materials have to have a periodic arrangement uh, of pores. There are also many useful porous materials in which the pores are not. Uh, periodic, and not only um, are the pores not periodic, um, they can also have a wide pore size distribution. Okay, that means that you not only have uh, a pore of a particular size, but you actually have uh, pores of a range of sizes that have a specific uh, um, distribution. And that distribution can be primarily in the micropores range, in the mesopores range, or the macropores range. It can even extend over all the ranges. Okay, so one uh, very interesting and also useful class of non crystalline porous materials are silica aerogels. Okay, so they are, have typically pores in the mesopores range of 2 to 50 nanometers, but they have a broad pore size distribution. Okay. So unless the periodic mesopause materials we have discussed, which only had basically one type of pore that has one specific pore diameter, we have here uh, many different uh, pore sizes throughout the material that follow a specific distribution, which depend on the particular uh, material. So, um, these silica aerogels um, are built from nanometer-sized silica spheres that are produced in a soil gel uh, process. So the reaction conditions are uh, in a way similar to uh, those in a Stoeber process that produces silica spheres, but the conditions are uh, slightly different so that these uh, spheres over the time can uh, weakly interconnect to form a three-dimensional uh, framework, which is then extremely porous. So these uh, gels uh, can have bulk densities as low as 0 0.004 uh, grams per cubic centimeters. So if you compare this to air, then this is only slightly more dense than the density of air, which is 0 0.00129 grams per uh, cubic centimeter. 
So the density is only about four times higher than that uh, of air. And the reason for that is that the porosity in these aerogels um, is extremely high. They typically exceed um, 95%, okay? So um, what is the internal structure? As I mentioned before, these uh, silica aerogels are made of little uh, uh, silica spheres that are uh, nanometer sized. Um, so you see actually here an electron uh, um, micrograph. So this scale bar here is 20 nanometers. So you see that each um, silica sphere is only a few nanometers um, in size, but then these spheres interconnect to make a three-dimensional framework, but the three-dimensional framework is uh, again, um, highly high pores. It has a porosity of 95% of, uh, or larger, okay? So because you prepare these, these aerogels in a soil gel process, you get these aerogels as a, as a monolithic piece as shown here under the right uh, conditions. However, it is not uh, trivial to prepare these aerogels uh, um, uh, crack free. Um, so after the soil gel process, you still have um, solvent in the pores and that solvent in the pores basically stabilizes um, the pores framework because it fills the pores from the inside. But in order to make your aerogel truly porous, you have to remove that um, solvent. So the solvent is typically an aqueous solution. And if you just um, heat the aerogel in air in order to remove that aqueous solution, what typically ha happens is that your that your gel uh, cracks, okay? So your, your monolithic piece breaks up into many smaller fragments. So you need special treatments in order to prevent that. And usually you use uh, a chemical treatment in combination with supercritical drying. Um, <coughs> so for the chemical treatment, you can, can for instance, use um, trimethylchlorosilin and what this does is that the uh, 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 chloro groups here, they react with um, unreacted silanol groups. Um, we see here some, um, for example, and uh, uh, cap them, okay? So that makes them unreactive. And upon heating the material, um, these silanol groups are not available anymore for further polycondensation, okay? Under the elimination of water that shrinks the material producing cracks um, in the material, okay? So this is one way you can avoid uh, cracks. And um, another way that you can do in addition is that you dry uh, the aerogel with supercritical CO2. So this is a very mild way in order to extract the solvent from the um, aerogel and that, that also can um, avoid the, 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 the cracking and also the collapsing of pore. So I found uh, actually two nice videos on YouTube about aerogels and I just wanted to show them to you. So I'm just switching the screens um, briefly. need to find it again. So it seems that I first have to exit here. Now I hope I can access the yeah, Firefox. Then we can go here. And let's do the new share. Let's share this. 
And then let's just play this. My name is Alex Gash. I'm a materials chemist at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in Livermore, California. Today's Quest Lab is all about aerogel, the lightest and lowest density solid on the planet. This material on the inside is made up of very small nanometer sized particles of silicon dioxide that are interconnected in a porous network lots and lots of very small pores. In fact, if you were to take one gram of this material, flatten out all of its uh, nanostructure and expose its surface area, it would cover an area the size of a football field. For its density, aerogel is incredibly strong. Aerogel can hold in compression up to 4,000 times its weight in force. Even though it's got this good compressive strength, it is very brittle. One of its best properties is its thermal insulation. The excellent thermal conductivity properties of the aerogel are because of its unique structure. That torturous porous path that I showed makes it very difficult for there to be heat conduction either through the solid or through gas from one side of the aerogel to another. Although aerogels have been known since the 1930s, it's really only been in the last 20 years that we've been able to look at some real interesting applications of this material. Aerogel may someday be used by NASA to insulate spacecraft, and potentially one day it can be used to insulate your home. From Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, I'm Alex Gash. Thanks for joining us on this Quest Lab. All right, so this video showed uh, some of the, 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 the properties of uh, aerogels. So they are incredibly good uh, thermal insulators and they are also mechanically quite strong, uh, but they're also particularly um, brittle just because they are still a, a ceramic material, um, which is extremely less dense. So the other video that I have prepared is more about the synthesis. So it shows you briefly how a, uh, a synthesis process can actually look like. So Let's start this one. So this one is in Dutch, um, but I can actually easily translate this because Dutch is relatively similar to German. So first of all, we are preparing this mixture here, terifoxicillin, ethanol, water, and hydrochloric acid. So that actually produces the soil. So you're hydrolyzing the tetrahydrocyanin acid catalyzed using the hydrochloric acid. So you just stir this for 90 minutes at room temperature so that there's enough time to hydrolyze um, the tears and then you actually add ethanol and and base in order to um, adjust the pH so that the silica spheres um, can actually start to form.
So you just stir this again for 30 minutes at room temperature. So then the polycondensation process for the spear formation has already started, but at this time we still have a soul. Okay. Now we fill actually that soul into these um, syringes, which are being cut off in order to allow for more time to complete the gelation process. So we just cover this with parafilm and let it basically just standing for a week, okay? And then the soil will turn into the gel. Okay, so now it has actually gelled. So you see now the liquid has actually turned into a solid and you can just remove that gel from the, from the syringe. You can actually just wash out the uh, base by adding some more ethanol. And the next step, then you exchange the solvent uh, to hexane. <laughs> and you see that process still keeps the gel pieces largely intact. Okay, so now there's the capping step. So you react this now with uh, trimethylchlorosilane in order to react the cyanoid groups on the surfaces to avoid the shrinkage. Okay, so you let react this for 24 hours. Okay, um, now you let the um, solvent evaporate. The reaction should be now also complete. So on the last step, you can treat this 400, 400 degrees Celsius in order to kind of cure this, and then your aerogel is actually finished. All right, you see it hasn't worked perfectly um, because the ones cylindrical monolithic pieces have already cracked into few smaller pieces, but still you have um, pretty large aerogel uh, pieces um, around it. So this just as a, well, illustration of a process, how you can prepare um, silica aerogels, which are an amorphous type of porous materials. So now let us go back to the PowerPoint slides. Um, and discuss in the next the carbon aerogels. So you cannot only make aerogels from silica, you can also make them from carbon. And you can do this um, by the controlled uh, polymerization of resource anole and formaldehyde. Uh, you've already learned about this reaction when we discussed the preparation of a periodic mesopause carbon. Um, under slightly different reaction conditions, you can also make carbon aerogels. In particular, when you react the reactants um, in uh, uh, base, under base catalyzed conditions in aqueous solution. Uh, then again, the well, resorcinal units uh, polymer, uh, polymerize, so are getting bridged by CH2 groups. And because of the basic conditions, 
um, the particles that are forming are getting charged. And that, again, can lead to uh, spherical um, particles that have um, three to two nanometers in diameters. And then just like the silica particles then intercon can interconnect to form a framework, these spherical particles can also interconnect um, to form a framework material, which can be about as porous as uh, silica aerogels. So in the last step, you can then, um, well, just carbonize at 1000 degrees Celsius an argon, and then your polymer highly porous polymer turns into a carbon uh, aerogel. So interestingly, you cannot only make uh, graphite like uh, carbon aerogels. It is even possible to make uh, diamond uh, type aerogels. So when you take a regular carbon aerogel and take it to a pressure of 21 to 25 gigapascal and uh, 1500 Kelvin with neon as a pressure medium, then you can transform at this high temperature the sp2 carbon into sp3 carbon without the um, collapse of the pore. Okay, and that is possible because of the pressure medium neon. Okay, so the neon itself at very high pressure of 21 to 25 gigapascal is actually a solid, okay? And of course, the neon is perfectly inert, so it doesn't undergo any chemical reactions, but it's also highly, it's a very soft material, okay? So therefore it's ideal as, as, as pressure medium, okay? But because the neon um, can also uh, penetrate the pores because it's uh, it's it, it's so small. Um, the pressure that is actually applied externally uh, using your diamond envelopes does not only act from the outside of the particle to the inside, but also from the inside to the outside because of the uh, hydrostatic conditions. Okay, so the, the the pores are therefore perfectly stabilized by the neon which is inside of the pores. And therefore the pressure actually only acts on the pore walls, okay, which then densify and form actually a diamond um, SP3 type um, carbon uh, network without um, the, uh, the pores of the aerogel actually collapse, okay? So this way you can actually densify the, the pore walls, okay, um, without um, actually collapsing the pores. Um, the pore walls are actually surrounded. Okay. So um, there are actually uh, other ways to make uh, pores diamond materials. You can st also start out from uh, mesopores, periodic mesopores carbons, uh, for example, CMK8, and then use the high, uh, even without a pressure medium, and then use the high reactivity of that porous carbon in order to transform the carbon into diamond, sp2 carbon into diamond at a relatively mild uh, temperature uh, conditions, okay? So uh, at 21 gigapascal and 1300 degrees Celsius, you then get uh, brown monolithic pieces of which you can see here a, a photograph. Um, if you go to uh, somewhat higher temperatures, you're getting um, um, uh, somewhat yellowish uh, monolithic monolithic pieces. So these are both essentially transparent and that indicates that um, light is actually not refracted. And that indicates that you actually have either a completely dense structure or a pore structure with pore sizes which are smaller than um, the wavelengths of uh, visible light. 
and uh, we can analyze this uh, further. Um, and you see here um, an electron diffraction pattern of uh, a particle. Um, and you see that you see here concentric rings that can actually assign to the diamond structure. And when you look at the TEM, you see actually a strong electronic contrast um, at the meso scale. And that shows you that um, diamond has formed, but the diamond itself is uh, porous, okay, at the, at the meso scale. So the interpretation of this is that the high pressure uh, is sufficient in order to trigger the nuclear nuclearization of the of, of diamond small diamond nanoparticles but um, um, due to relatively mild temperature conditions of the relatively small reaction time these diamond nanoparticles uh, sit together only very ineffectively okay leaving a, a fairly significant pore space in between these uh, diamond um, nanoparticles. So you see actually here um, a high resolution um, electron microscopy image in which you can see that the nanoparticles are actually crystalline. If you look here at the SEM, you see um, that the surface of the particle is made of, of very little um, uh, spherical-like uh, diamond um, particles. But when you do a Z contrast experiment, you can see that even though that surface here actually doesn't look particularly porous, it is actually uh, significantly uh, porous. So you can imagine this kind of structure similar to the structure of uh, well, sandstone, okay, which is made of, of single um, sand grains, which are, are sintered together, if you look on the surface, it doesn't appear porous, but nonetheless, um, because the weak aggregation of the little sand grains in the sandstone, there's still a significant amount of porosity uh, in between them. So interestingly, um, this um, formation of little diamond nanoparticles uh, only occurs above uh, 15 uh, um, gigapascals. And um, actually, the higher you go with the pressure, the um, higher the porosity of your material becomes, um, simply because of the fact that the higher the pressure, the more uh, uh, facile the uh, graphite to diamond transformation um, can occur, so there's less much opportunity for uh, poor collapse before that transformation can occur. For that reason, a more porous material is obtained at higher uh, pressure. So below 15 gigapascals, actually the system behaves completely, such a system behaves completely differently. In this case, you're actually getting not a monolithic piece of uh, nanopolycrystalline um, diamond, which is porous, but you're getting individual nanocrystals. So if you go to uh, even more drastic temperatures, then you can actually um, center that nanopolycrystalline diamond further together. So you actually start to eliminate uh, the porosity and at uh, temperatures of about 2000 degrees Celsius, you're getting then um, nanopolycrystalline diamond, which is essentially as dense as um, a single crystalline diamond. Okay. So because that nanopolycrystalline diamond only has a structure at the nanoscale, okay, below the wavelength of the visible light, this kind of diamond like single crystalline diamond is transparent, okay? It's just that it doesn't have, uh, uh, it, it's just that it isn't colorless, but it has a slightly a yellowish brownish color. Um, so this color is actually typically produced by nitrogen impurities that produce defects in the diamond structure, okay? And these uh, nitrogen uh, impurities are easily introduced either because there's a little bit of nitrogen in your carbon or you just include a little bit of air uh, 
in your in your uh, in your um, capsule, and then that air, which is primarily nitrogen, um, becomes reactive with the cow material, and you and you actually dope the nitrogen with uh, dope the diamond with nitrogen to some extent, which gives the diamond then this a uh, yellowish uh, brownish uh, color here. Um, so when you carry out that kind of synthesis in a very large multi anvil press, and we've discussed multi anvil techniques before, then you can make uh, very large uh, monolithic uh, diamond pieces, um, which are about as hard as a, a single crystalline diamond, but actually have the property that they are tougher. So diamond single crystals, while extremely hard, they're actually not particularly tough. So that means that they are fairly uh, brittle. Okay, so if you drop a diamond on a hard surface, the diamond can actually break fairly easily into many pieces because it's relatively brittle. Okay, so um, this nanopolycrystalline diamond um, is actually tougher because of the fact that due to the polycrystalline nature, a crack can actually not so easily propagate through entire monolithic piece, but is, is actually more easily stopped at the grain boundaries. Okay. So um, that uh, um, a monolithic nanopolycrystalline diamond um, then can also be shaped into other useful structures using the fact that you can relatively easily oxidize diamond because from carbon to form carbon dioxide. So you can actually take a pulsed laser, okay, and shape these cylindrical pieces as they come out of your large multi animal press um, into useful tools. Okay, so for instance, you can actually make uh, diamond anvils uh, from these uh, nanopolycrystalline diamond pieces and can then use these um, diamond anvils again for high pressure um, experiments. And using these diamond anvils and multi anvil assemblies, you can then even go to um, higher pressures than the standard pressure that you can achieve with tungsten carbide cubes. Remember, with tungsten carbide cubes, you can go to approximately 27 gigapascals. With uh, diamond anvil cell, uh, with diamond anvil, uh, with diamond cubes, you can sig go significantly higher, up to a, a pressure of approximately 100 gigapascals. Then, okay. Um, last but not least, um, I wanted to discuss uh, activated carbons as a form of porous materials which have irregular pores and which are um, amorphous. So these activated carbons um, have many applications, uh, in particular as adsorbents. Um, uh, partly because they have good properties, good adsorbent properties, but partly also because they are very inexpensive. Okay. And they are so inexpensive because you can make them in a simple process from all kinds of organic materials, okay? Um, so we can make these activated carbons, for instance, from coconut shells, peat, hard softwood, lignite, coal, uh, oil pits, and other carbonaceous uh, materials, okay? So you only need in basically an organic precursor, okay? That does not melt upon the carbonization because the melting would actually uh, eliminate the porosity and has a high carbon content, okay? And little other components that would actually be inorganic and produce ash, okay? Then just by heating that organic material under the right conditions, you can actually produce porous carbon materials. So these active, so-called activated carbons are obtained in either granular, granular or powder form. Um, you can activate 
the carbons two ways. You can either do CO2 activation or you can do chemical activation. Um, so both activations um, increase, further increase the uh, uh, pore volumes um, and produce a higher surface area, but they also produce chemical functionalities on the uh, pore surfaces. So when you treat your uh, car material with um, steam um, or CO2, then you basically use these two reactions in order to in in increase the porosity of your carbons. So when you react carbon with steam, well, then the, the water can react with carbon to, to form a CO in H2. Okay. So this way you basically etch away carbon from your internal carbon surface and therefore there why you increase the internal porosity of your carbon. Okay. At the same time, you produce chemical functionalities on the pore surface. So for instance, keto, alcohol, or uh, carboxylic acid groups. When you use CO2, um, then you basically establish a so-called boudoir equilibrium. So carbon, the carbon, your carbon surface can react with CO2 in order to produce uh, CO. So again, effectively, you etch away carbon from your internal carbon surface. So you increase your porosity and you increase also your surface um, <coughs> um, area. So the other possibility is that you uh, activate your carbons uh, chemically. So this uh, method you typically use when you first want to swell your organic material, which is relatively dense. So for instance, uh, you use a chemical activation for uh, uh, when you have starting materials like sawdust, peat, um, or wood. And the most common um, chemical activator is actually phosphoric acid. So that phosphoric acid has the property to swell cellulose. Um, it can actually hydrolyze uh, the, um, the linkages within cellulose, and it can actually esterify the hydroxyl groups uh, uh, within cellulose um, by reaction with the phosphoric acid. So that increases the well, uh, internal uh, well, uh, volume within your organic material, and since it already makes more pores. And um, when you heat it to 400 to 500 degrees Celsius, then in the presence of a phosphoric acid, your um, material also carbonizes. And you can actually tune the actual porosity uh, in your carbon material um, by adjusting the temperature, but also by adjusting the uh, ratio between your organo uh, organic material and your phosphoric acid, which can typically vary uh, between 1 to 0 0.5 and uh, 1 to 4. Um, so one, for instance, 1 gram of organic material to 4 grams of um, phos phosphoric acid. So after that, you basically only need to wash away uh, your phosphoric acid and you have produced your, your activated uh, carbon material. So another way uh, of chemically activating carbon is actually the use of molten zinc chloride. So zinc chloride has a fairly high melting point. It can also actually swell and carbonize organic materials like uh, wood, but it's actually less common um, because zinc chloride has actually a larger environment, environmental impact and there's often actually zinc uh, remaining in the activated carbon in the end, so it cannot be used for food and uh, pharmaceutical um, industries. All right, um, then this was the chapter about um, non-pause, um, uh, sorry, non-crystalline pores uh, materials. Um, we will have the exam on Friday and I will uh, then after Thanksgiving 
hold three additional um, lectures um, about the applications of uh, porous carbon materials and supercapacitors. Um, but this material will not be relevant for any exam then anymore. So let us stop at this point.